Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Research Tuesdays event, Compulsory Voting, Strengthening Democracy. My name is Nick Drevis, and I'm the Marketing Manager, Research and Innovation, here at the University of Adelaide. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains, and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. After the postponement of the April Research Tuesdays event due to COVID-19, we are delighted to bring you tonight's event as a live webinar. Tonight, we focus on compulsory voting and strengthening democracy. Our first speaker tonight will be Professor Lisa Hill. Before taking up her position as Professor of Politics at the University of Adelaide in 2008, Lisa was a five-year Australian Research Council Fellow at the University of Adelaide, a five-year fellow in political science at the Australian National University, and lectured in politics and political theory at the University of Sydney. Lisa's areas of interest are electoral law, electoral behaviour, political theory, history of political thought, and political corruption. Our sp second speaker tonight will be Professor Adam Graycar who is Professor of Public Policy and the Director of the Stratton Institute here at the University of Adelaide. Adam has had careers in both academia and government, having acquired extensive policy experience over 22 years in various senior level posts. He has held both in the Commonwealth and in South Australian governments. He has also worked extensively with global agencies such as United Nations, and World Bank. Adam has two doctorates from the University of New South Wales and is the author of some 250 publications, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and a member of the Order of Australia. Each presenter tonight will speak for approximately 20 minutes and there will be opportunity to field some real-time questions at the end of tonight's presentation via the webinar platform appearing on your screens. I would now like to invite Professor Lisa Hill to the stage. Thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Nick. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about one of my research areas, um, which is compulsory voting. And um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the history, a little bit about the effects, but um, mainly what we want to focus on tonight is the way in which it strengthens democracy. Uh, and it does strengthen democracy. As far as I can tell, and I've checked everything, and I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, I'm with Politics and International Relations here at the University of Adelaide, but I'm also in the Stretton Institute for Public Policy, of which Adam is the Chief Professor and Director. So, um, Marion Saw, who's a very well-known Australian political scientist, once described Australia as the first nation created not by revolution, but from the ballot box. And she was referring to all the referenda we had to bring Australia into existence. And so I feel that Australia is a culture that's actually quite electorally focused, um, ballot box focused, and um, democracy focused, actually. Our democracy has also been marked by a lot of um, innovation. So we've never been frightened of trying new things. And compulsory voting is considered to be a very strange and unusual thing to most people uh, in voluntary settings. But it's something we've always lived with and it's probably our most important innovation. And yet, strangely, our, our, our less imitated innovation. Other nations seem to be very cautious and scared about adopting it, but they shouldn't. It's not scary, it's quite nice. Now, we actually weren't the first nation to use compulsory voting, though we'd like people to think that. Switzerland and Belgium got there first. Uh, there's only compulsory in a couple of Swiss cantons. It's still compulsory in Belgium. But we're the only English-speaking country to use it and one of the few advanced democracies that use it. We're also a great example of a successful regime that is constantly experimenting with improvements. So we introduced compulsory voting so that we could maximise electoral inclusion and we keep experimenting all the time to refine the system, to in improve its inclusivity, but also to improve its... Um, integrity, which is very important in our system. It's very important that if you're making everybody vote, that the system functions very well and with high levels of integrity, so that people trust the outcome of the election and also feel that it was worth their while to go out and vote. 
Uh, some countries are now thinking about legislating to introduce compulsory voting because of the democratic crises we're having worldwide and civic demobilisation we're having worldwide. Right now, Vanuatu and Samoa are working on introducing it. They're doing it to combat the, the problem of female underrepresentation and corruption. And they're likely to have be, that, that, that is likely to be a successful solution to both those problems. Now, compulsory voting exists where the state imposes a legal requirement to vote. The term is a little bit misleading, though, because it doesn't involve the requirement to mark the ballot formally. So you're not actually being asked to vote. What you're asked to do is to turn up, have your name ticked off the roll, and put a ballot in the ballot box. So it's really only attendance at a polling place that's legally required. You can put in a blank ballot or an inf a, a vote that's informal in another way. You can mark it. You can protest on it, if you like. And believe it or not, anything you put in there is recorded by the Electoral Commission. Not Your name, obviously, isn't attached to it, but they're interested in the kind of material that uh, people are writing on their, on their um, ballots. And also, I'm very interested, and so am I interested in the, the rate of ba uh, blank ballots. It's actually telling me something about what's going on out there. So it's only attendance. The Netherlanders even had a word for that when they had compulsory voting um, or compulsory attendance up until the 1970s, well, 1970 really, and that was called omkomspit. Just meant you're only required to attend. We're not saying you have to vote, and you don't have to vote. But personally, I think it's better if you do vote. We had compulsory registration in 1911. Uh, then we didn't get it at the federal level. Um, uh, to, to, to have mandatory voting until 1924. If you want to have a uh, look at some historical background as to the lead-up uh, of compulsory voting and the introduction of that law, Judith Britt has recently written a very nice book about it. And there I've got a picture of some Australian punters relaxing with their towels and about to vote. Nobody seems stressed out is the reason I put that, that slide up there, and I'll show you some more Australians in their relaxing wear and voting in a minute. Now, aside from regularising the electoral roll, compulsory voting was introduced to address the problem of low voter turnout. Now, I think it's quite funny that we thought our low turnout was scandalously low at 58.7%, which is what is usually in most uh, established democracies. But we didn't think it was good enough, so we introduced it. And then it was an extremely effective and decisive remedy. It worked straight away like that. And then it stayed like that all along. So, in electoral studies, they're grateful, people in electoral studies are grateful if something they introduce uh, gets turned out to rise by 3% percentage points or 7. To get that amount of a surge uh, is pretty impressive, over 30%. And it's been able to keep us there in that range uh, ever since. While in other established democracies, turnout's declining, 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 ours has remained steady. So some of the questions I'll be looking at today, some I'll be paying more attention to than others. Under what conditions might it be appropriate to compel people to vote? And I'll just quickly flick through that and you can go back over the slides if you're interested. Why is compulsory voting so well tolerated here? You may or may not know that Australians are actually perfectly happy with their arrangements and they've stayed that way for decades. About 30% don't like it and about 70% do like it. No matter what's going on out there, that is basically the, 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 the breakup of the figures. Some people say, well, compulsory voting does nothing more than raise turnout. I'm going to explain that it does more than raise turnout, but I also want to point out that what's wrong with raising turnout? It's not a bad thing. It's not just a question of numbers. Some people say that compulsory voting makes citizens more apathetic. I'm going to look at that question. Some people say it makes government less effective. I'm also going to look at that question. God, I'm running out of time already. I better go fast. The, and the last question I'll look at is whether compulsory voting is a violation of democratic values or whether it can actually enhance some democratic values. So I won't dwell on this very much, but I, I just want to point out that compulsory voting is not appropriate for every setting. You have to have, uh, you already have to have um, a good infrastructure for this to work well and a high level of trust in the electoral arrangements. You can't have it in a one-party state where it might be used to forge consent or legitimise one-party contests. It wouldn't be appropriate. Um, you have to have a well-established system of democratic institutions with proper uh, civil and political rights, so it can't be dangerous to vote. And of course, you should have universal suffrage. You should have free, competitive and fair elections. You should have the proper apparatus of constitutionalism, limits on political powers, and all those other things that go to what I call an authentic democracy. You'd have to have a nice national infrastructure for it to be appropriate, uh, which we do have. 
reasonable levels of cooperation between the regional and central governments, which we do have, and you'd have to have professional, well-funded, independent and accountable electoral officers, which we do have. The reason we have those conditions is partly because we had compulsory voting. When we introduced compulsory voting, we decided, well, we better make sure uh, this system works well. If we're going to get everyone voting, we better have properly funded electoral commissions. So we're one of the first places in the world to professionalise our electoral commissions. And we do have a very good system. You also need to make sure that there are few opportunity and a transaction costs to voters, meaning it shouldn't be burdensome. If you're going to make people do something in a democracy, particularly something that everyone thinks of as a voluntary type of activity, make sure it's, it's not hard. That means you shouldn't have to go very far. You shouldn't have to cost you money to travel somewhere. You shouldn't have to forego um, other enjoyable activities in order to vote. You shouldn't have to have an election on a Tuesday where you have to leave work and maybe miss out on um, earning power. If you live in the outback, it sh there should be uh, a polling booth readily available, which there, there is here. There's almost no transaction or opportunity cost to voters in this, in this country. Now, the reason I put pictures of Australians half naked in their bathing gear is because they are not foregoing an enjoyable activity like a day at the beach or the pool in order to vote. There's plenty of spaces there. They, can t they know they're not going to be standing around naked for too long because uh, they'll be in and out. There'll be enough ballot papers, there'll be en there won't be a long queue, and there'll be plenty of um, booths there for them. So they're going to the pool or they're on their way back from the pool. It's also preferable if there's a degree of genuine choice in the political offer. You can't herd everyone into vote and then have no decent choice among the candidates. That makes voters angry. We know in some settings where it's compulsory, voters will return a lot of blank ballots if the political offer is unsatisfactory. If you have PR, uh, proportional representation and preferential voting, that's going to expand automatically choice. First past the post depresses choice, so, but we've got that stuff, PR and preferential. Public acceptance is very important. So you have to make the, the experience meaningful for people and there has to be real choice. Now some people say that compulsory voting does nothing more than raise turnout. So one of my interlocutors, so I'm involved in paper wars at all times with people that think compulsory voting is a terrible idea. And they'll say, oh, well, it just raises turnout. But before I talk about what else it does, I'd just like to pause to point out that raising turnout is not nothing. Having high turnout is great. Surely that's better than low turnout. My interlocutors say, well, they're just numbers. Who cares? They're not just numbers. I do care. And I'll come back to this in a minute, how the composition of the electorate changes when turnout's high. Now, other folks say there are less coercive ways to raise turnout. And of course, if we want to do something, it's much better to have a non-coercive way of doing it than a coercive way. Obviously, nobody likes coercion. I don't either. So they say do Saturday voting, absentee voting, lowering the voting age, PR, offer incentives to vote, improve registration, put voting booths in malls, etc., online voting. But even if you've got all the different ideas about how to raise turnout and put them all together, you still wouldn't be able to have the same turnout raising power as compulsory voting. All those things together would still not give you turnout in the 90% range. Also, we, we added all that stuff as well. We do most of that stuff in, except for um, offering incentives to vote. We have all that stuff just to top it off, just so there's no chance that we're not maximising inclusion. Good on you, Australia. <coughs> we actually do a very good job here. So compulsory voting is very effective at raising turnout. Uh, it can do it from a, from a minimum of 12 to a maximum of 30 percentage points, but usually now the magic number is 30. Chile, when it uh, got rid of compulsory voting, turned out immediately plummeted by 30 percentage points and it stayed down there. It's the only institutional mechanism that can achieve turnout rates of 90 percent and above on its own. Further, its effect on turnout is immediate and lasting. So it doesn't just, you don't just get a spike, it obviously continues. You don't have to wait for it to kick in like with electoral education, let's educate people to like voting more. That might work, but you might be waiting for decades for that to work. Compulsory voting works straight away. And further, further, I don't have to have a fancy theory of why people don't vote for my suggestion to work. So I might say, well, if people learn more about how wonderful voting is and how effective their vote can be, they'll be more likely to vote and then they try electoral education and it doesn't work, we try something else. No one 100% knows why people don't vote. And so let's just cut to the chase and get them to vote. And so that's what compulsory voting does. I, we don't 100% know why they don't voting. I've got a few ideas. But the best way to get them voting is to have compulsory voting. It just works.
So it's had a positive effect here in, in terms of raising turnout and expanding the franchise. Now that's really important, the number and range of people who vote. So it's not, not just raise the number of people who vote, the kinds of people that vote. And that happens in any system where it's administered properly and with, with proper sanctions. So you've got to have a little sanction uh, for it to work, but that's kind of symbolic. $20 is not a lot for failure to vote. The thing is in Australia, voting is so easy that it's easier to vote than it is not to vote. It's more trouble to have to write a letter to the AEC and say, or the, your local liquor commissioner why you didn't vote than to vote. Now, Australians don't mind. Around 70% for decades have said they like it. And a vast majority of Australians comply with the laws. And in a recent large-scale study, when asked what they like most about their democracy, most Australians agree that Australian elections are free and fair. So they're well run and they're free. They, they thought it was a pretty good system. And it's even risen in recent years, while everyone else in the world is running for the hills, away from their ballot box. Why Australians so accepting of CV? Well, first of all, voting is so easy here. The sta ha state handles most of the opportunity and transaction costs. It's made sure it's on a Saturday. It's made sure it, the voting uh, polling places are numerous and everywhere. There's postal voting, there's uh, absent voting, there's declaration voting, any kind of voting. Uh, there's silent voting if you're worried about your name being on the electoral roll and someone being able to find out where you live. Um, if you're more than eight kilometres away from a polling place, you don't have to vote. So it's a pretty uh, user-friendly system. Also, the penalties are applied consistently, with, but without zealotry. The Electoral Commission always follows up, but it doesn't get nasty. If you write a letter saying, oh, I wasn't well that day or my car broke down, they'll say that's fine. And it's only a $20 fine at the federal level. There's also a high degree of trust in our electoral process. Because it's so well run, and it's well run because we had compulsory voting, so then we had very high levels of electoral integrity and electoral management, there's a high degree of trust in the electoral process. At the end of every election, a lot of people might complain about the outcome, meaning my party didn't win, but nobody in Australia goes around saying that wasn't a fair fight. Nobody goes around saying something went wrong there. So our electoral officers are very well organised and they run very well. So Australians have great faith in the mechanics of their electoral process. Therefore, the accuracy and procedural legitimacy of outcomes are rarely, if ever, disputed. Also, Australians report being happy with the amount of choice they have on their ballot paper. They say, well, I, I felt I had a good choice and there were differences between the candidates. It wasn't really Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The other interesting thing about Australia is, and I think we're seeing that now with COVID-19, is Australians place more value than almost anyone in the world on obeying the law. Now, we like to think of ourselves as larrikins and kind of naughty people. We are naughty people. We do like to have a lot of fun and to sometimes push the envelope. But when it comes to the law, I feel that Australians feel themselves that they have signed the social contract and therefore, and that their, their government is also more responsive to them when they don't like something because they vote. So they feel invested in the laws and they feel that we should all obey them. So this is why we've had the high level of compliance in Australia compared to a lot of other settings with the government request to stay at home. Australians also tend to see voting more as a duty than a right than people in other places. They thought the most important thing about being a good citizen was always voting in elections. In other settings, they didn't rate that the number one thing, but Australians said, yeah, you've got to vote. Come on, we've all got to do it, so what's the problem? And Australians therefore seem to regard the imposition to vote as an acceptable imposition on their individual autonomy. But some people see compulsory voting as antithetical to democratic ideals and an unnecessary imposition on personal autonomy. So some people in Australia and some people from outside Australia that don't like our compulsory voting system. And they say, so what if it raises turnout? Low turnout's nothing to worry about. And they even say it could be a good thing. Annabel Lever, for example, says that people in voluntary systems abstain because they're satisfied with the status quo and happy to go along with what others decide. So in voluntary systems, they're not voting not because they're unhappy, but because they're, just, they're, they're, happy, uh, uh, but they're actually happy with the system, so they don't feel they need to vote to complain about it. So that she says they're conferring tacit consent. So uh, when I read that, no, there was no study on this, so I went and found any few study I could find on the attitudes of non-voters in voluntary systems in established democracies, and I found out that they're far less satisfied with democracy than are habitual voters. It's not a sign of tacit consent at all. It's a sign of absolute contempt and, and walking away feeling kind of, uh, kind of political despair. 
Another of my interlocutors says that a country with universal suffrage and high levels of turnout is uh, not more democratic than one with similarly universal suffrage and lower levels of turnout. In other words, as long as everyone's legally allowed to vote, what's the problem if they choose not to? And that these low turnout elections are no less legitimate than high turnout elections. So that's a good question, isn't it? Is, do these turnout levels make any difference? As long as you're legally allowed to vote and you, if you choose not to vote, well, fine, if nothing's stopping you. But then my question becomes, how low is too low? Before you start, I get your attention. 50%, 40%? 15% as you get in some uh, gubernatorial elections in America, 15. Isn't anybody worried now? Are they still even calling this a democracy? If nobody votes but everyone is legally allowed to vote, are we still going to call it a democracy? And I would say, I don't think so. Something's really up with that. Also, just the quality rather than quantity of voter information change. So first of all, you're getting more information from voters about what they want, even if it's exactly the same, if everyone would vote exactly the same, but 90% uh, um, of voting versus 50%, but it was the same outcome. Still, it's good to be able to say, well, we checked, and that's what you wanted, good. Secondly, does the quality of uh, the input change? Yes, it, it, the quality of, um, or, or the type of votes that come into the system when turnout's high changes, because when turnout's high, more diverse inputs are captured. Now, it's an ironclad rule just about in electoral studies. Low turnout means low and socially uneven turnout. Turnout will be concentrated among the prosperous, among the white, among well-established citizens, among the highly educated and people who own homes. And failure to vote will be concentrated among everyone from marginal groups. This in turn, now but when you get compulsory voting, all these people that normally vote suddenly are voting. This causes representatives to behave differently. When everybody votes, especially when the poor and marginalised are voting, electorate, elect, um, representatives have to behave differently. This is because of the old truisms. Truism that if you don't vote, you don't count. And if you do vote, you do count. Politicians pay attention to voters. I don't know why my interlocutors don't concede that point, but everybody knows that Attentive publics, which are voters, enjoy the attentions of politicians. Now, according to Jason Brennan, who's my number one interlocutor, in fact, we wrote a book together, a for and against book. When I say together, he wrote his half and I wrote my half. He says that compulsory voting changes the quality of the electorate. Under voluntary voting, the median and typical voter is less better informed, less biased. It's like a magic wand that makes the electorate dumber about politics. This is a quote, this is not me. Government tends to give the people what they want. This, thus, compulsory voting should produce somewhat lower quality and more incompetent government. Now, when I, I've highlighted that word should because when I read that quote, I thought, I got you, because you didn't check, Jason. So I thought, well, I'll go and check as best I can. It's not easy to do it, but I did go and check and looked at some applied studies. Are governments worse and voters dumber under CV? That's his word, not mine. I would use the word less sophisticated. No, governments are probably not worse under compulsory voting. For a start, governments in compulsory voting regimes are less corrupt. There's less political corrupt corruption in these, these settings. We already know governments must be better. Bad governments are corrupt, good governments are not corrupt. That is a well-known fact. For, secondly, compulsory voting regimes have less income inequality because they're not just representing well-off voters. So governments are more representative of the entire population, just not just the privileged sections, and they're more responsive. So they're also less corrupt in the broad Aristotelian sense that the government is supposed to represent everybody. Because turnout is more socially diverse, it makes governments more representative of the people as a whole. They're more attentive to, the, to voting groups, and now that everyone's voting, they have to be attentive to everybody. And so governments are not supposed to just vote uh, to serve the interests of those who voted. And they're not just supposed to serve the interests of those who voted for them. They're supposed to represent everyone's interests. So instead of just helping those who are already better off, which is what you get in a voluntary system, they're helping everybody. And there's no shortage of studies that prove that. If you want to check my book that I wrote with Jason Brennan, uh, you can see all the millions of studies that show that. If you get a, a constituency voting, suddenly they get government attention. Compulsory voting is also correlated with high levels of satisfaction with democracy, both in Australia and elsewhere. 
Now, some people are claiming that we're getting declining levels of satisfaction and trust in government. That's a blip. We've had levels that low before. But something we do know actually for sure that it's not declining is that Australians have very high levels of faith in the mechanics of their electoral process. Also, citizens in compulsory vo voting regimes are not politically dumber. This has actually been proved uh, empirically in three studies that were carried out on citizens in voluntary regimes versus citizens in um, mandatory regimes. And the citizens in the mandatory regimes are more attentive to the behaviour of governments. They're more politically sophisticated and knowledgeable than people in voluntary regimes. This is because they know they have to vote, so they start paying a little bit more attention. And finally, I just want to address this point about uh, compulsory voting violating personal autonomy. Does compulsory voting violate personal autonomy? Of course it does. Anything the government makes you do, being made to send my son to school is a violation of autonomy or pay taxes. The question is whether it's a justified violation of my autonomy. Being made to send my son to school is actually justified, so is paying taxes. Otherwise, how can I ride on the roads and how can I have the kind of amenities I have in this society? How can I have law and order? So is it a justified violation of my autonomy? We compel citizens to do things all the time. Now, compared to having to pay tax or sit on a jury or send my son to school, um, which are all solutions to collective action problems, compulsory voting actually imposes a very minor inf infringement on my uh, personal rights because it takes up so little of my time and energy and costs me virtually nothing. And the autonomy objection, so the, auton the, the autonomy objection can still be there, even if I can explain what's great about compulsory voting, because uh, my adversary might say, well, but I value autonomy so highly that none of the good things you tell me about it uh, can make me accept that compulsory voting's a reasonable imposition. But if I can convince my adversary that what I get in exchange for giving up my right for the choice to the choice to abstain, which incidentally is not a real right, no court has ever recognised it, but say there was such a right, I might be able to convince him. If I could explain to that person that you get a more legitimate government in the eyes of, in the eyes of political theorists, but also in the eyes of the population, you get a more representative government, you get more political equality, so you really start to realise the value of one vote, one value, Everyone's vote counts now. You get more inclusiveness, you minimise elite power, you get less corruption and you get more responsive government. So I think it's a pretty good deal for that minor imposition on this so-called right to abstain. And I think I better stop there because now we're going to hear from Adam about what happens after everybody's voted. Well, thank you very much for that, Lisa. That was really informative and it was interesting and it laid out a whole lot of challenges. And there are two challenges in that talk that I want to pick up a bit more on now. One is about governments being more responsive when there's compulsory voting and the other as being less corrupt. And what I want to talk about really is a sort of integrity envelope of which compulsory voting is one part. Now you vote, after the vote what happens next? You know, how does government work? Where does it all come? And what makes it work as well as it should? And sometimes we say it doesn't work all that well. In fact, there's an old saying that says, if you love sausage and have a respect for the law, you should never watch either of them being made. Anyway, you know, the key issue that we have is that we have robust processes and, a, and an impartial public service, and that's a very important part. And while not all politicians think that the public service might be impartial, we see a continuity, but in recent decades we've had situations where politicians have fired department heads when they've come into government figuring that the trust isn't there. But when we look at the whole electoral process, what happens is that during the election, the government goes into caretaker mode, 
and no policy decisions are taken in that process. You know, a committee of public servants basically makes the day-to-day -day decisions and uh, consults with ministers, but they're not about policy things. They're about the routine things that happen in government. And there's also, with the public servants, a management of election issues. There's the proroguing of parliament, there's the arrangement of uh, issuing writs, etc. And also, while the election is being held, the public servants are very busy writing incoming government briefs. One for each side, a red book and a blue book. I've forgotten which colour is which at this stage. And, and there are two components of these uh, in incoming government briefs. One talks about the state of play in the department and the issues that are looming. And the other component is how the election promises of the various parties are going to be implemented. It's not up to the public servants to say whether they're good or bad ideas. It's up to the public servants to say, well, this is what you've promised and this is how it's going to be put into practice. Sometimes with difficulty, sometimes with ease, but nevertheless, it's uh, an integrity issue of impartiality. And after the election, there are machinery of government issues. Uh, there are advice that usually comes from the cabinet office about how the machinery of government processes might work, what the portfolios of the ministers, the politicians decide this. But there's the swearing in, there's the recalling of parliament, there's the preparation of the governor's speech. All of this is a process that is part of the integrity envelope. And uh, in the Cabinet Office, for example, which is an essential but non-partisan part of government, there's a whole processing of the decision-making process. It's the administrative hub for Cabinet meetings. It coordinates the Executive Council, which acts, actually puts into law, signs into law, um, the things that the legislature passes. It provides support for Cabinet and Cabinet committees that monitors compliance with cabinet processes, um, against agreed cabinet procedures, it monitors cabinet decisions to make sure that they've all been put into place. And all of this is part of the integrity of governance along with compulsory voting. They're segmented in different ways, but they come together as a whole. And government's responsive as Lisa said, it's responsive not only because people have voted compulsorily, but because there are established processes, a registration process, a voting process, uh, an orderly uh, <clears throat> prorogement of parliament, a coming together afterwards, uh, advice for ministers and governments from public servants about the machinery issues of government and how the things that people have voted on can be put into effect. And of course, look, politics is a tough game. <clears throat> um, politicians aren't always responsive to every whim, every wish in the community. Uh, people often wish they were responsive to every whim and every wish. They play, uh, go, politicians play politics hard, crossbenchers play it even harder because very often they hold a balance of power. But let me talk a bit more about integrity because we can start to look at some of the contrasts. Lisa talked about uh, the small number of countries that have compulsory voting. And uh, I don't want to start comparing us with countries like Somalia or Afghanistan or uh, Sierra Leone or somewhere like that where there are huge gulfs. But if we compare for a moment with uh, you know, the bastion of democracy, the shining light of uh, our democratic history, the United States, though Lisa made some comments saying that she didn't think the United States was as democratic as it might be. But voter turnout's very, very small, about half of what we've got. And uh, less, the less the voter turnout, the more in the United States that uh, the democracy is diminished. And there are many reasons for this diminution. And I think nobody would say that the circus we've got in the United States at the moment reflects at all well on democracy or 
could in any way be called a solid administrative success. Yeah, but it's interesting. I lived in the United States for a few years. I worked um, with people in government. I worked as an academic, but we had close links with government. And uh, I'm now here a professor of public policy at the University of Adelaide. And I say so often, look, we've got nothing to learn from the United States about public policy and even less to learn about democratic processes. And it's important to do the contrast to understand the integrity envelope. There are two things about elections in general, and they are highlighted and contrasted between, say, the United States and Australia. First, in the United States, elections can easily be bought. Often with impunity, it's very much a winner-take-all situation. Uh, whoever wins it then feels that they have a mandate to go down a particular path. They don't always, can't always put stuff into process, and I might come back to some of that. So elections, on the one hand, can be bought, and on the other hand, in contrast to our system, the public service in the United States is very weak. It's very process-oriented, but when we get to policy levels in the public service in the United States, there's essentially a ceiling and people above the basic executive level of government are all political appointees. After each election, they all hand in their resignations, all the executive officers, all of the ambassadors, numerous people, and it takes almost half a term to get them back into place and you get elected or you get put into these positions very largely if you're a big donor, if you say the right things, if you're regarded as a safe pair of hands. But it's interesting also to look at the way in which elections can be bought and perhaps to uh, you know, contrast a little. In the United States, the um, 15th Amendment uh, made voting, uh, made, vote, it said the voting could not be a, a bridge, the right to vote could not be a bridge on the basis of uh, class, colour, or uh, race, co race, colour, or uh, previous conditions of servitude. And yet, people of colour are not in a position to buy elections. But in 2010, the Supreme Court in the United States, through, in a judgment known as Citizens United, uh, essentially abolished the cap on uh, corporations' donations to political parties. It was a 5-4 decision. But what it meant was anybody or any corporation uh, could have no limit on the amount of donations they could give. They could not only buy elections, but they could buy specific policies. They could buy specific programs. They could buy specific access. And the argument in this was this was a First Amendment right, and this was about freedom of speech, and money was like speech. So money buys speech, buys power, and so on. But in contrast, in 2016 in New South Wales, the State Electoral Commission uh, withheld public funding to the Liberal Party uh, for not disclosing political donors that had given money in the previous election. And then the New South Wales Parliament had also uh, passed legislation saying that uh, property developers were not permitted to make donations to political parties. And this went to the High Court in a case called uh, McCloy's case. And the High Court confirmed the ban on property developers making donations. So we've got you know, this very distinct contrast that helps shape our voting situation. And in the United States, without compulsory voting, elections can easily be stolen. And we've seen that again and again. You know, and, and there are two 
basic ways of uh, stealing um, elections, one by voter suppression and the other by hacking. Um, and both of these processes, voter suppression and hacking, weaken, weaken the integrity of elections. And when the integrity of elections is weakened, then the ability of government to do what people want the government to do or what people vote for the government to do is similarly weakened. Now, the hacking issue is an interesting one because um, there's a move to online voting, electronic voting, and uh, what's happened in the United States is that the technology is not very good. It's not very good in many areas, but uh, the voting area, and in fact, America, having lived there, I was always surprised at how poor the level of technology for average people was in terms of things like banking and phones and so on. But in the voting area, um, they bought, by and large, poor quality machines. The experts said, look, these machines aren't real good. They're easily hackable. We saw that in the 2016 election. Uh, the experts kept saying there were no checks, there were no, uh, <clears throat> no way of making sure. And in the state of Florida in 2018, there were 127,000 votes that went missing. There was no trace of them. They just went Missing. They went missing. No trace, no footprint, no receipts, no nothing. And all of these were in areas, in precincts that had black majorities. And some of you might remember, uh, going back to the year 2000, Florida again had the whole issue of the hanging chads, which then determined the outcome of the 2000 uh, presidential election. So you've got a technological glitch, 127,000 uh, votes go missing and nobody gives a toss. Compare that to Western Australia or the, the Commonwealth in the 2016 Senate election. Um, some votes went missing. I've forgotten how many. It was a ballot box or a couple of boxes. Anyway, the votes went missing. But the Australian Electoral Commission then decided to rerun the whole election, to rerun the Senate election for Western Australia. Huge cost, huge inconvenience, huge disruption, but nevertheless, you know, this was the way uh, it worked and this was the reflection on integrity in that process. So as we then move towards the 2020 election, There'll be a, in the United States, there'll be a huge focus on voter suppression. This is a big issue because uh, following the 15th Amendment in 1870, which gave uh, people of colour the right to vote, there have been systematic approaches uh, in recent years, particularly in the last five or six years since the uh, 2013 decision of the Supreme Court to essentially trash the Voting Rights Act. And this again comes back to the, what happened in 2008. Um, something like five million more minority voters voted than had ever voted before and they voted for a black president. And a lot of people didn't like that. And they've been working to make sure it doesn't happen again. And blacks and immigrants are targeted. You know, at one point, Lisa talked about polling booths being accessible. Uh, since 2012, 1,688 polling booths have been closed in the United States. And voting is almost invariably on a Tuesday. So you've got to give up work. And uh, the polling booths that have been closed are generally those in minority neighbourhoods, in poor neighbourhoods. Uh, there have been voter purges. People turn up to vote and they say, you're not on the roll. And they say, yes, I am. They say, no, you're not. And they say, well, you know, you can write a letter, you can appeal, but they've missed the vote. And uh, these have been systematic voter purges. 
There have been uh, <clears throat> attempts to curb voter registration drives, and in Tennessee last year, uh, volunteers who tried to get out the vote for minority voters sometimes put in forms that were incomplete. They had blanks in them, and they would. And the state legislature passed uh, legislation uh, charging them uh, that they would be charged with a criminal offence for um, having documents that were not accurate and present them as legal documents. Then you get uh, uh, ID, huge ID issues that you turn up, you stand in line for hour after hour, you show your ID and it turns out that you needed two pieces of ID or three pieces of ID or one more piece of ID than you actually had with you, whatever the number you brought with you. Then there's the whole issue of uh, <coughs> Con disenfranchisement of people who'd committed felonies. Again, in Florida, uh, 1.4 million uh, people of colour had had convictions over time. Yeah, a teenage kid might have nicked a car, gone to reform school or gone to jail for a couple of years, and 40 years later that person is still unable to vote because of the conviction. So they passed a law. Uh, there was a citizen-initiated referendum to restore the rights, uh, but then what has happened then? The state legislature passed legislation saying that, yes, they had the right to vote, but they had to pay back the court fees, the expenses in the court for when they did their trial, the expenses that were incurred in their arrest. And in essence, this was another form of poll tax. And then, of course, there's been um, a whole range of intimidation of minority voters, a whole range of intimidations where people said, look, you know, if you, have to, if you register, you've got to give us all this information about your family and where you came from and all your relatives in the United States. And some of these might be illegals or, I mean, all sorts of things. And so people are kept off the roll. So you put that package of goods together, you put that package of goods together and you have a situation where voter turnout is low, uh, votes are suppressed and very often elections are stolen. And so this then leads into um, other issues about the responsiveness and the integrity of government. So I want to just spend a quick minute or two to just talk about the second point that uh, I wanted to pick up from Lisa, and that was about less corruption. Um, countries that have compulsory voting generally are less corrupt. It's not just compulsory voting, but value integrity in the voting process. Um, and the countries, the Northern European countries, New Zealand, they do very well. Australia, come on the transparency international uh, corruption perception index, it's interesting, Australia had always been in the top 10, coming around about eight out of about 180. And in the last few years, it's fallen from about eighth to about 13th. Some people say this is a monumental crisis for Australia. Others say, well, it, it sort of levels out because what we've seen is a, a, a fair bit of activity about politicians who've broken laws. Eddie Obede in New South Wales was uh, you know, a prime case of forcing the voter, uh, <clears throat> the com corruption perception index down. But what we've got... What we've got is a situation that when we see a politician uh, charged with some sort of corrupt offence, there is monumental community outrage. Um, and the book very often gets thrown at them. And this is in contrast. This is in contrast to other countries where it becomes the norm. And uh, the way to look at this is, you know, where corruption is the norm, generally voting integrity is not high. Where corruption is the exception, which it is in Australia, because you know, we can all go about our daily lives without the fear of being shaken down by a public servant or a politician asking us for a bribe or whatever, we're in a different story. But electoral commissions are ranked very highly as integrity agencies in most countries where voting integrity is high and in Australia where um, compulsory voting is uh, the norm.
So what we've got, yes, we do have issues with uh, political donations. We do have issues with the transparency of donations. We do have issues with undue influence of politicians. We generally, generally don't have issues with politicians getting bagfuls of cash to do stuff. Though we did have a case in Queensland about a decade ago of a politician doing that. But what I want to finish with is just to say, looking at, we've got an integrity envelope. We've got an integrity envelope that starts with the sort of regist compulsory registration and compulsory voting. Then it goes through to robust governmental processes that happen during elections and after elections and the bringing together of uh, parliament and the uh, whole uh, process of government, then we've got an inclusive ideology saying that you know, everybody can have a go and be part of it, and we have continual review and transparency and uh, people know where they stand in the process. Now, not everybody likes the outcome of every election, as Lisa says. Sometimes your side doesn't win. But generally, you know, we take it and say, well, that's the way it goes. Um, the process uh, delivered the result that we've got and uh, we go on with it and we do the best we can. Thanks very much. Thank you to Professor Lisa Hill and to Professor Adam Graycar for that very passionate and informative presentation. We now have opportunity to field some questions. Um, both Adam and Lisa will be online to field those questions. So please um, send your questions through now. Thank you. Thank you for submitting your questions. We've got quite a few questions coming through uh, and we have had some questions um, sent to us earlier tonight. Um, so thank you. Um, the first question tonight is um, compulsory voting in Australia for federal elections. Um, so I'll throw this one to you, Lisa. Um, would it not be easier to vote electronically and calculate the preferences rather than paper voting and counting at the end of a very long day? In a way, it would be easier to, to vote online, but I don't think it would actually be in any way better. Um, the one way in which it would be better, though, is as you surmise, Glennis, which is that uh, voting would, uh, counting would be faster definitely would be faster. But that's really, as far as I can see, the only benefit you would get, especially here. You might get a few outliers like shut-ins or people with disabilities or the young voting in slightly higher numbers with electronic voting. But the thing is, you might lose a few things as well. And one of the things I think we might lose is, um, first of all, um, elections in Australia are actually festive occasions. We all come together, we all share the democratic moment, um, it's quite nice, actually, and we're all there together. And so it's one of the few occasions for solidary um, democratic activity where we're just all there together and we're all voting together. So I find it quite festive with the, the sausage sizzle and all that. Um, secondly, I would worry about uh, interference, even though that's not a huge worry. We have run electronic elections here uh, in New South Wales and in Canberra without a lot of interference. But I keep thinking about that, that big census, census fiasco we had, and I, I would worry. And so it's really a question of what problem are we trying to um, solve? If, if it's a turnout problem, our turnout problem's not too bad, except young, among young people, it's declining. Uh, we might help some people with uh, infirmity or disability, that might help. But basically, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily help. The other thing I would worry about uh, but this can be accounted for, but most, most voting systems don't account for this, but this can be built into the system, is that when you have an um, electronic system, uh, electoral commissions are so focused on capturing as many formal votes as they can, they don't always allow for the informality of the vote. Now, it might sound mad that I think you should be allowed to vote informally if you want to, but I think in a compulsory voting system, if you're being compelled to vote, the least we can offer people that uh, object to it, remember there's always 30% that object to it, we should allow them the possibility of casting a blank ballot or an informed vote and also the possibility of writing comments just like people are able to do on the blank ballot. They, a lot of people write, um, you know, crude messages, but most people don't do that. Most people write a political message on their ballot. And so I'd want that opportunity to be there for people. Uh, so 
I think there's, there's something to be gained, but more to be lost, to be honest, with electronic voting. Uh, next question um, is around, again, voting and uh, voting the solution for everything. So, for example, um, if we were to use the current pandemic and um, voting to download the COVID app, uh, COVID safe app, and if the majority voted yes, does that mean we have to force everyone to download the app? Uh, were you going to answer that? Adam? Uh, I'll just start uh, very quickly to say what this is really about is um, a debate about the philosophical basis of government. And that is, is government about citizen-initiated referenda? In other words, do citizens vote on every issue or do we vote for representatives to make the decisions for us? And uh, our pattern has been to vote for representatives. Uh, they group together, they come together, uh, they have an agenda. And one of the difficulties, if you have a citizen-initiated vote for every issue, particularly a partisan issue, you get monumental distortions because uh, everything gets reduced to a quick sound bite. You don't get the detailed consideration of policy. So it's a philosophical uh, issue. But Lisa, you've probably got uh, other thoughts. You've got uh, something you can add to that. Yes, I do have something to add to that. Well, first of all, you make the point that we live in a representative democracy because it's a mass society. We cannot be involved in every single decision. Where we see settings with citizens initiated referenda, they are subject to a lot of distortions, particularly by moneyed interests, but that would be less of a problem here. Um, but, but the job of government is to make decisions on our behalf because we're busy making a gazillion decisions every day um, on, in our own lives. So we we're supposed to trust government. And when we've voted for them in election time uh, and we've all voted, the government is actually more trusted and more trustworthy. That is not to say that citizens shouldn't have some input in between elections, but we don't need to vote on everything. But this might actually be something to vote on because... It's a security and public health issue of great importance. So it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a void question. It's actually a sensible one because uh, it may be a question on which we should all be asked to vote, but in a way, people already have voted. <laughs> they voted they will download it or they voted they won't download it, but they haven't quite voted on it in the way that the question means. Um, but that might be a particularly good example where we, we might sometimes ask the people to, to vote but you wouldn't want to be doing that all the time, um, not least because there's a thing called voter fatigue. Now, in Switzerland, they have referenda night and day on everything, and they have, they have the federal system as well, and people there get sick and tired of being asked their opinions on things, and that depresses turnout. So they only have turnout in the 30 to 40% range because people get sick of voting. So you don't want to wear citizens out. You've got to have just the right amount of voting um, for citizens to stay connected to and to have trust and faith in their, in their voting system. Great. Um, given, I guess, um, that it is compulsory, um, why is it that preferential voting is considered to be an advantage over, I guess, one person, one vote? I think that's first past the post, isn't it? No, it probably meant first past the post, I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 Because under both systems, you'd have one person, one vote. And Adam, you might have something to add to this, but I'll just explain it briefly. It is a, it is a vast improvement on one, one, one uh, first past the post. And here's an example. Say you're in England and where they have first past the post, or America. Um, in voluntary systems, it depresses the vote because there's a very good chance you won't get anything you want. Say there are three candidates running and... 33% vote for one, 33% vote for another, 33% vote for another. Or 34% vote, let's say. That means 66% of people don't get anything they even remotely like. So it's not a good system for maximising choice and satisfying voters and giving them some kind of representation. With um, preferential voting and also proportional voting, you can, with, let's say it's prefer <coughs> preferential voting, you might not like uh, the second preference, <clears throat> but they're not bad, or the third. So it gives you the least hated person. But you might get your third preference, but at least you get something. 
Everyone can get something in a preferential system. Their third least like, most like person or their second most like person, but they don't end up with nothing in their hand. This is why you get low turn, one of the big reasons why you get low turnout in, in, in first class to post systems. People just feel, what's the point of my going? There's no way I can get my candidate up. I'm wasting my time. And they literally are wasting their time. In a preferential system, you're never wasting your time. Never, ever. There's going to be someone in there that you kind of like. You can't get your first preference, but you might get someone in there that you like. You get some degree of, of representation. So it's, it's a vastly superior system, in my opinion. Generally, yes, but if I can just add one yeah. little bit, that people are mostly able to work out, as you say, their second or their third preference. But when you're down to your 45th preference, yeah. Yeah, it becomes a bit of a farce. And we've seen some situations in Australia through the Senate system where people with negligible numbers of first votes uh, have been elected to the Senate on a 30th or 40th preference vote and uh, people wouldn't be able to do that. And, and there has been an attempt to reform the voting system in that way to, you know, cut off uh, after about the fifth or the sixth or whatever preference. So, yes, uh, it's fine for a small number of preferences, but when you get into a lot, it becomes a bit of a farce. Yes, okay. um, another question that's come through, should prisoners have the right to vote if they are removed from society? Yes. Yeah, I've done some work on this. Um, prisoners are citizens and they are persons. That means they're bearers of rights. They don't stop being a human being and they don't stop being a bearer of rights just because they've been removed from society. A person that's in hospital is removed from society um, that, that has to live there, but they are stu still able and legally able to vote. Um, losing your right to vote should not be a collateral effect of having committed a crime. Losing your citizenship, the most important citizenship right You've lost the, the right to perfect liberty but, uh, of movement, but you haven't lost the right to be a member of the demos. And we know uh, that a lot of judges, when they're sentencing, don't even know that loss of voting rights can be a collateral um, uh, penalty. They're not even aware. And they might, might be more thoughtful about it if they, if they knew. But there, there's no reason why a, uh, a prisoner shouldn't vote. And in fact, if the purpose of incarceration is rehabilitation, not punishment, surely we would want to um, use voting as a rehabilitative tool. Now, this isn't just a surmise on my part. Um, a good friend and colleague of mine, Victoria Shinneman, has done some studies on the restoration of voting rights to prisoners in the United States, where they systematically try and exclude prisoners from the votes, from, from voting rights. And when you reinstate those rights, Incredible things happen with the behaviour of the prisoners. First of all, there's lower rates of recidivism, as, as um, surmised by me in previous work. It turns out people are less likely to commit a crime and they, they report more pro-social attitudes. They report more law-abiding attitudes and friendlier attitudes to, to other human beings and more trusting attitudes towards other human beings and a less likelihood of infringing the rights of other human beings. So there are so many different reasons to reinstate the voting rights of prisoners. Don't get me started. <laughs> we are getting lots of questions coming in, but we are running out of time. So there's probably time for probably two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one question that's come through is around political donations. Um, and the question there is, does the political donation and lobby system mean that the system, I guess, is only there for the wealthy and for the well-organised? This is a hard one uh, because in a democratic society, people want people who think like they do to take the reins of government and uh, generally they support them. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the wealthy buy elections and buy uh, the outcomes they want, that's a distortion of the democracy. So the way through it, um, we've got a reasonably sensible way of doing it by having caps on uh, donations, but also, but also uh, we 
need to have more transparency. And one of the debates is about real-time transparency. Rather than waiting, rather than waiting for 12 months or more after the election to put in a return as to what sort of uh, donations you had, as the donations come in, that could be an important thing. But what is important is whether a donation buys an election. In other words, when you give a donation, what do you want in return? Do you want a general ideology? And that seems a fairly legitimate thing in a democratic society. Or do you want a very specific policy that other people oppose? So buying elections is a terrible thing, and there are ways that this can be managed. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, final question for tonight, and it's around sort of the electoral cycles. And the question there is, how do we get long-term thinking in politics with such short-term electoral cycles? Well, one of the things is about the vision and the coherence of policy processes. Um, <clears throat> you know, what do politicians listen to? And most political parties try to think, have a vision of the sort of society that they want. They have a vision, they have policies in process. Sure, stuff can't, gets in the way. And looking right now at the COVID situation, looking at the way in which the budget uh, isn't coming out the way that the, gov the Commonwealth government wanted it to come out, it, there are great uh, disruptions and uh, the ideology behind a lot of the activities may not well be there. Um, there's no simple answer. It's about uh, holistic visions. It's about uh, being able to portray a set of values that people will support you with rather than uh, always throwing a bit of candy out to the electorate. Lisa, do you have a comment on that? No, I don't have anything to add to that. Thanks, Anna. Okay, well, thanks everyone. And um, that brings us to a close for tonight's event. Um, so I'd just like to thank our two presenters, Professor Adam Graycar and Professor Lisa Hill um, for that yeah, informative presentation. And thank you to everyone at home for tuning in um, via Zoom and via Facebook. We hope you will join us again next month. So take care, stay safe and good night.